I had absolutely no concerns. I mean, it was a very standard procedure. To saw blue around his lips, and then suddenly his heart stopped. I look at this young, smart boy who had so many prospects in life. All that's been taken away from him, as well as our family life as it was. Our lives completely changed overnight, and it'll never return to what it was. When mistakes are made in hospitals, they can have catastrophic consequences. So your husband was sent home with a first-degree heart block, mm. having been misinterpreted by a medical student, mm. having had two heart attacks. Mm. Can't really be forgiven, I don't think, to be truthful. It's chilling for patients that it might not have happened if they lived somewhere else. Frankly, it's unacceptable that your postcode can determine the quality of healthcare you receive. Medical staff are warning about systemic failures, which they think seriously compromise patient safety. I'm aware of the consequences of speaking publicly. As a colleague of mine said to me, at the end of the day, it's your integrity that counts. And I believe that's true. <laughs> Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate what's going wrong in Australian hospitals and how where you live can have devastating consequences for your health. It's a chilly winter's night at Launceston General Hospital in northern Tasmania. Nurse Tom Millen is on duty at the emergency department. This has been one of the worst weeks that I've, I've been up. This is my sixth night shift, and this is every night has been horrendous. We have been at capacity. We've had people ramped in, in corridors. We've had critically ill people not being able to put them in appropriate clinical spaces so that they can be assessed and treated adequately. It has been horrendous. I don't think I've sat down in my, my 10 hour shifts this week. It's just, it's just been, it's just been very, very hard. Like so many hospitals around Australia, resources are stretched and staff are under constant pressure. And the further you live from a capital city, the worse those pressures are, with potentially fatal results. It's terrible. You go home at the end of a shift knowing that because of the circumstances that, that you are forced to work under, you are unable to give a person potentially safe and adequate care. The problems in patient care in Tasmania's hospitals were this year exposed in a scathing report. Nine out of ten admitted patients in Launceston were spending close to 40 hours in the emergency department. 40 hours? 40 hours. That's incredible. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, amount of time within the emergency department. It's been reflected in a dramatic rise in harm to patients. We looked at the adverse events over a period of five years. We found that over that period of time, the number of adverse events had increased by 60%. And in particular, when we looked at Launceston uh, Hospital uh, specifically, that had increased by 50%. Nurses have got a fairly dark sense of humour and we used to, to make a joke that, oh, nothing's going to change until someone dies. But we don't make that joke anymore. Because people have died? Because people have died. And we know that, that this is going to keep happening until something is done about it. John Navasky was one of those people. The 76-year-old was a much-loved family man. Hello, darling. How are you going? He was my husband. He was the kid's dad. We did everything together, and I'd retired a couple of years 
before and, um, yeah, we were sort of planning things and hmm, you hope to do so many different things and it just doesn't happen. Hmm. In October 2017, John was at home in the small town of Turner's Beach when he complained of breathlessness. He'd had two recent heart attacks. John was basically just lethargic and said, I just feel like I can't even walk to the mailbox. His GP, Dr Tony Lyle, arranged an ECG test which showed a heart blockage, so he was a high-risk patient. His heart wasn't pumping as it should do as it would normally. And um, his condition was um, increasingly at risk with time. Dr Lyle sent John immediately to Launceston General Hospital's emergency department with a referral letter and the ECG. The emergency department at Launceston General Hospital was under enormous pressure the day that John Navasky's doctor sent him here. 17 patients had waited in emergency for more than 24 hours, and one patient had been here for 61 hours straight. John Navasky was triaged and was supposed to have been seen by a doctor within 30 minutes. He sat in the waiting room for nearly five hours. We expected him to be admitted to hospital and see a cardiologist, and that didn't happen. I didn't know at the time, but he'd been seen by a fifth-year medical student without even a doctor being present. What should happen in those circumstances? when someone comes with a, you know, serious heart condition? Um, well, basically all, sh all stops should be pulled out and um, uh, the problem sorted out as, as quickly as possible. It was so busy, the medical student saw John Navasky in his waiting room seat. John was never seen by a qualified doctor. The medical student looked at his ECG but misinterpreted the results. After a blood test and a chest X-ray, the doctor decided to send John home. Can't really be forgiven, I don't think, to be truthful. John Navasky was on the lounge room floor when his wife returned from a brief errand the following morning. When I came home, I found him and he'd gone already. Mm. It's just um, heartbreaking to think that perhaps if they'd have kept him at the hospital, I might have been able to hold his hand. Hmm. The Tasmanian coroner found John Navasky's care at Launceston General Hospital fell well short of the standard required. Most critical, in my view, said the coroner, was the decision to discharge Mr Navasky without first ensuring that he was reviewed by a cardiologist a serious and hard-to-believe misjudgment. It's disgraceful, I mean... When a person's sent by his own GP uh, with a letter to be admitted to the hospital and to see a cardiologist, and all you see is a student without a doctor, I didn't know that until the report came through. And I was astounded. Over the past two years, the coroner has criticised the standard of care in Tasmanian public hospitals in 13 separate cases. 
The crisis cost the state's health minister his job two months ago. His replacement declined our offer of an interview, but said her government will be building extra space in Launceston General Hospital to open more beds as soon as possible. Every patient should have the opportunity to be treated. Doesn't matter where they are. Why should a big city hospital be better off or have better treatment for the patients than here? The latest figures from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare show that the rate of potentially avoidable deaths increases dramatically the further you live from a capital city. So for every 100,000 people living in a major city, 91 die. That number jumps to 136 in outer regional areas and it's a startling 248 in very remote Australia. The disparity between people living in major cities and people living in rural and remote Australia in relation to health outcomes is widening. We are at a crisis situation. Frankly, it's unacceptable that your postcode can determine the quality of health care you receive. When you look at the sort of catastrophic failures in our health systems, the high profile ones, these all happened in regional areas. And I don't think it's a coincidence. Regional health services are understaffed, they're desperate for doctors. They're often under-resourced. Um, and how we fix that, how we sort of change the balance is, is, you know, something that requires a lot of input from different, you know, from government, from the colleges, um, from the regulator, um, and, you know, frankly, more resources, more money. In Gippsland, in country Victoria, La Trobe Regional Hospital's emergency department is overflowing. Paramedics are queuing up, waiting to unload patients, and medical staff are run off their feet. Code Yellow 6 Emergency Department, Code Yellow 6 Emergency Department. The one you heard then was a Code Yellow 6 which is critical patient load in the emergency department, which means uh, the, the department will be full and we have a number of ambulances trying to offload. So it's a bit of an all, all hands on deck situation. It's been a terrible flu season and a lack of GP clinics in the area who are willing to bulk build patients has put the newly built ED under pressure. And since the last 12 months, since our emergency department opened, we've had a 17% increase in numbers. So we, this financial year we've just finished, we hit over 40,000 presentations to the emergency department. One of the biggest challenges is attracting trainee doctors and specialists. Latrobe's trying to do this by investing in high-tech medical equipment, but it's still not easy. You just feel like sometimes you're up against it all day, every day. Recruitment of specialists to rural and regional Australia is a challenge. The recruitment market is highly competitive and we're actually not seeing the new medical graduates come out into these communities at the moment and there needs to be more work done to encourage them. Seventeen-year-old Brittany Thomas was a patient at La Trobe Regional Hospital. Brittany's dream was to play professional cricket. Last year, after a tour of Hong Kong, she returned home with a fractured thumb. I went to the doctor and then he, she sent me up to get an X-ray. And then once I got the X-ray, she they said to me straight away, go back to the medical centre. It was literally split down the middle of my knuckle. A local orthopaedic surgeon operated to repair Brittany's fracture at La Trobe. During the operation, a tourniquet was applied to her thumb. They were like, oh, this is just going to stop the blood flow for the surgery and we'll take it off once we're done. It was like an elastic band, basically, 
and they just, yeah, put it around your thumb. Brittany's thumb was set in plaster. Five days later, she was in unbearable pain. She went to her local GP clinic. Literally the worst pain I reckon I've ever been through. And what did it look like by that stage? It was purple and blue and it was just, yeah, didn't look normal. They pulled the plaster off and it was very dark, it looked very dead. The skin was all yucky. I was actually, yes, mortified. It was horrible. The tourniquet had been left on Brittany's thumb, underneath the plaster. Of course, if you leave that on and continue to restrict the, the blood flow to the thumb, it, it will die. And that's what happened here? That's exactly what happened here. It really is one of the most basic errors that we would see in our practice. It's, you know, really medicine 101. It's unacceptable and pretty hard to understand how that happens. They took me into the emergency and they were like, oh, you're probably going to lose your thumb. What and did I you was, say? I was just like, what? Like, I was in just so much disbelief and I was like, what's this going to happen? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my cricket? Most of Brittany's thumb was amputated. For weeks, what was left was stitched to her groin to try to get the nerves and arteries working. Doctors created a new thumb with her big toe. A big toe was created with hip bone. People ask me and they're like, oh, why does your thumb so look so weird? And I'm like, because it's not my thumb, it's my toe. I felt sick in the stomach. It, it's very devastating, you know, that you see something happen like that. Um, you know, we, we, we thought we had robust um, procedures and policies in place to ensure that we had a very safe environment. Latrobe Regional Hospital CEO Peter Craighead ordered an investigation. The tourniquet was left on. That's correct. And you had the checklists in place. Yes, we did. But the staff checked that the tourniquet had been taken yeah. off. They made an error and they checked. At, they wrote that it was taken off and it wasn't taken off. How does that happen? Uh, it's a human error. The best thing we could do is make sure that what happened to Brittany didn't happen again. And that's, you know, and it's been it's been gut-wrenching for a lot of our staff. It was very, you know, we weren't the victims, but we were part of the problem, and it, it really, our heart felt thoughts go out to the family. Brittany missed so much school, she dropped out. She recently went to the local nets to pick up a bat for the first time since her toe became her thumb. I couldn't grip the bat around it. Yeah. And is that because your thumb can't bend there? Yeah, because I don't have a knuckle there. Yeah. How does it make you feel? Pretty shit. Because now I was from being able to do everything and now I can't do anything. So we are facing a crisis in rural and remote Australia in relation to health services and health outcomes for rural and remote Australians are concerning and we need to actually turn our attention and provide better systems, better resources to address this issue. This is Broken Hill in far western New South Wales. 
senior clinicians and nurses who worked at the Outback Town have decided it's time to go public about systemic failures that have dogged Broken Hill Base Hospital for years. In 2017, they warned about mismanagement and risks to patient safety. I've worked in 13 different locum hospitals since I've retired, and I've never seen anything like Broken Hill in my entire career. There was general concern about the level of um, governance, clinical governance, which means essentially about safety for patients and the resources we didn't have and the staff we didn't have to try and execute the best possible safety. I spoke to the general manager. I said that I was concerned about the culture in the department, that staff weren't listening, and I felt that, you know, if we didn't try and change this culture, there could be a catastrophic event. That someone could die. Mm. The case of 18-year-old Alex Braze is at the heart of their concerns. In September 2017, Alex had a painful, swollen knee. His father took him to Broken Hill Emergency Department at 3.18 a.m. The staff there assumed he had a sporting injury. He was given instructions of rice around a sports injury, which is rest, apply ice, compress and elevate. And uh, then to sort of see how he went from there. And to come back the next morning for an ultrasound? Yeah, that's right. Um, Did they do any bloods? No. No. No routine vital sign observations, such as taking his temperature or pulse, were carried out. Should vital sign observations happen as a matter of course with every patient that is triaged in the emergency department? Well, I have a strong opinion about this and I would say yes. It's simple, it gives you so much information and it takes so little time. At 8am, Alex Braze was still in a lot of pain and returned to the hospital for an ultrasound. He expected a doctor to review his results, but that didn't happen. It was so busy in the emergency department that morning, Alex and his father were told they'd be better coming back later in the day. Another opportunity for medical staff to make proper observations was missed. At 6 p.m., Alex returned to hospital for a third time. He was told to rest the leg and to come back in two weeks if the pain didn't settle. But still, no one did vital sign observations. Unfortunately, it's a very serious omission that somebody who's been repeatedly in the emergency department hasn't been gone over with a fine-tooth comb. It's just indefensible. By 10 o'clock the next morning, Alex's pain was excruciating and he couldn't walk. His father called triple zero, but couldn't get an ambulance, so he drove Alex to the hospital himself. Alex was unable to get out of the car and so his dad went to triage, which is the front of the emergency, and asked for some support to get him out. But it took 25 minutes to get um, uh, one of the staff to get a wheelchair to assist him from the car and bring him into emergency. But he sat then in emergency for a further 20 minutes or more, um, being desperately unwell. Vital sign observations were finally done at 12.17, mm -hmm. 33 hours after Alex Bray's first presented. All I can say is, it's, it's, what can you say to that? It's, it's um, unbelievable. 
Alex deteriorated so badly, a rapid response team was called, led by Dr. Benin O'Donoghue. Alex was semi-conscious. He was rambling. He wasn't responding to simple questions. He was cold, clammy, sweaty, and he was uh, uh, significantly blue and mottled. Uh, and this mottling color is really a very ominous uh, uh, feature. It means he's been unwell for a significant number of hours at that point. It was about that time that the source of Alex's pain was finally discovered. Alex had had an infected toenail. The infection had entered his bloodstream and was by now coursing through his body. Alex was in toxic shock. He had an aggressive, deadly, flesh-eating disease called necrotizing fasciitis. Max McLean came on duty that afternoon as the nurse manager. The kidneys start to fail in what is an overwhelming sepsis, and that was something that we were battling against because we didn't have the resources to actually support failing kidneys. That's why we needed to get him out. I spoke to the director of medical services at 25 past one and informed him that we had the sickest patient I'd seen since my time in Broken Hill. If you're in a, a remote centre, um, there's a need for what I express as a grab and go. So you need to move that patient as soon as you possibly can to an organisation that has the facilities, the staff, um, to manage the patient as best as possible. So was there grab and go in Alex's case? No, there was not. Staff struggled to get Alex a bed at a major city hospital and to find a plane to get him there. Thirteen hours elapsed from the time he was admitted at Broken Hill to when he finally arrived at Sydney's Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Not long after, he went into cardiac arrest. Alex was pronounced dead just after 2am. Is it acceptable in Australia in the 21st century that an 18-year-old dies of an infected toenail well, it's... on his fourth presentation to no, the hospital? No, 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 I don't think that's acceptable. Somehow, people didn't recognise that this was a spiral, just going down, down, down. And when it did get recognised, because the right sort of person was involved... It was too late. It was too late. He should not have died in the manner and in the, at the time he did die. I think we, we've, we, as a medical profession, we as a health service in New South Wales, we failed Alex Brace and we failed his family. In New South Wales, hospitals are required to refer unexpected deaths for a formal investigation to be completed within 70 days. But in Alex's case, it took one year. It only happened because of the pressure from the medical staff who spoke out. I was gobsmacked that it didn't prompt an investigation straight away. I actually spoke up and said, we need, we, we have something to answer here. Anaesthetist Dr Benin O'Donoghue resigned, citing management and patient safety issues. He wrote to management saying, in my opinion, at times, this hospital is not fit for purpose. They didn't actually come back to me. It was categorised as having a spray. That shows one of the other problems in Broken Hill, and that was that the management team were not open to criticism. They, they, they were not, they, they, they didn't listen to senior clinicians. They felt that senior clinicians were there just to make money and were just, you know, pumped up, opinionated individuals and they didn't listen to what they said. And this is a, a failure of clinical governance. Should heads roll over this? Of course they should. Well, they would in a proper corporation. 
you'd go to all your managers and say, look at your performance, look at the outcome, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. <clears throat> Heads should roll. In November, five doctors went to see the health minister to try to prevent another case like Alex Bray's. We spoke to the avoidable um, death of Alex Bray's to try and establish that something as simple as a, an infected toenail had led to a loss of an 18-year-old healthy young man. It was a circumstance that I couldn't, as a, as a father, have imagined happening. Um, and I, my, my great sympathy and sorrow, actually, to his family, it was, uh, it was a horrific outcome. Um, and uh, such a young man, only 18 years old. The minister commissioned a report which made 30 recommendations about improving management of the hospital. But there was no mention of the death of Alex Braze. Why is it that the very reason that they came to meet you, the death of Alex Braz, mm. is not mentioned at all in the review? Um, the review that was done was specifically, obviously, out of that particular circumstance. I can't answer why the particular reviewer, I mean, that was appointed by the Ministry of Health, as you'd expect. I mean, I'm not a clinician. Um, what I can do is share the pain, share the anguish, and I do feel that, um, of the family, I am so sorry. I think it's horrific. Uh, the whole event is horrific. But from my point of view as health minister, I can't do those reports. I can't recommend that the reports be done a particular way. After this interview with the minister, the chief executive of Broken Hill Hospital resigned for personal reasons. Alex Braze's parents are too distraught about their son's death to speak about it publicly. But they told us that they felt that the way he was managed left them feeling that for the hospital system, he was worth nothing. I didn't know his family. I, I didn't know Alex Braze. But I can say to you that I think of that boy frequently. And I think that the clinicians who would have been with him when he was so sick in emergency will not forget him. They won't forget Alex Brace. And that's why you're all coming forward? Yes. Yeah. In a lush valley in southern New South Wales lies another hospital with a troubled history. The old Bega District Hospital was blighted by a series of scandals affecting patient safety. I would like to think that lies with the administration of that hospital and how it's been run. And it's been run abysmally bad from our point of view. In 2014, there were particular concerns about the anaesthetics department. Emails leaked to Four Corners show surgeons met to voice their concerns. They cited dangerous anaesthetic practice and patient near-death experiences during uncomplicated procedures involving a specialist who supervised the GP anaesthetists. Surgeons have informed the Director of Medical Services and General Manager and had our concerns brushed aside. There was a fair amount of tension between surgeon and anaesthetists. Um, it was a very difficult time. He's coming down. Oh, this is going to be a hard one. And he makes it. Growing up near Bega at that time was a little boy called Kieran Reynolds. I look at this young, smart boy who had so many prospects in life. All that's been taken away from him, as well as our family life as it was. Isn't it cool? Sure is. Bought it for 90 bucks. 
Now that is just a little video of our skater extraordinaire, Kieran. And it's almost his birthday. Rock on, mate. My name's Ben Marker. <laughs> In 2015, when Kieran was 14, he became suddenly ill. As a result of an unusual reaction he had to the B strain of the flu, he suffered uh, swelling of the brain, which caused confusion, disorientation. Kieran had to be flown to Sydney for treatment. Before the flight, he had to be connected to a ventilator via what's known as intubation. His parents, who were both nurses at the hospital, were familiar with the procedure, which was carried out by a GP anaesthetist. I had absolutely no concerns. I mean, um, yeah, it was a very standard procedure. What do you need to do when you intubate someone? Well, you need to make sure that patient's oxygenated. So they, you've paralysed them with the drugs and you need to make sure that that, ox that oxygen is getting into their lungs. It's absolutely critical to make sure it's in the windpipe and not in the gullet, which yeah. lies immediately adjacent to the windpipe. Because if it's in the gullet, what happens? No oxygen is getting in to the lungs, therefore it doesn't get to the bloodstream, therefore there's no oxygen going anywhere else, such as the brain, the kidneys, the heart. Not long into the procedure, Kieran's heart rate and oxygen levels began to drop. I was only outside a very short period of time when uh, I heard a cord blue go off. If somebody calls a, a code blue in the hospital for a patient, it means that um, an emergency has occurred. They've had um, a drastic um, drop in their observations. They're not stable and they need urgent help. They saw blue around his lips and then suddenly his heart stopped and nobody seemed to have any idea why. The breathing tube had been put in the wrong place. For about 20 minutes, oxygen pumped into Kieran's stomach instead of his lungs. I'm still baffled to this day as to why they didn't realise what was happening. It, it would have been obvious to anybody in that situation. It would seem that they tried just about everything before the anaesthetist eventually came round to thinking about retubing him, replacing the tube. Mick Reynolds asked the GP anaesthetist how long his son was deprived of oxygen. I says, I don't care about what happened here or why it happened. All I want to know is how long was Kieran down for. And I was told categorically, he looked at me, he looked at the other staff and he says, don't worry, you have nothing to worry about. It was no longer than three to five minutes. Three to five minutes? Yep. In fact, it was 18 to 20? Yes. Kieran's parents only discovered the truth at Sydney Children's Hospital, two days after Kieran was admitted. The neurologist showed me the MRI scan that they'd taken of Kieran's brain, which showed a, a global hypoxic brain injury that he had been deprived of oxygen for a long period of time. The um, the inten intensivist doctor there had said, this is the sort of injury that happens after um, about 20 minutes without oxygen to your brain. An investigation found the critical event was the failure to use a device called a capnograph, which measures carbon dioxide levels in the breath. The GP anaesthetist admitted he'd never used one in this setting. It was a failure to follow Australian guidelines. Is there any explanation for a capnograph not being used when an intubation has been planned in advance? Um, I would think no. I cannot think of a situation where you would deliberately choose not to. And I don't believe that was a deliberate choice not to use it. It was a mistake, an oversight, an error of omission. 
the guidelines are there for a very, very good reason to prevent such an incident happening. This wasn't human error. This was a failure to adhere to those recommended guidelines. The hospital admitted liability and paid compensation to the Reynolds family. They accepted that they caused Kieran's brain injury. Um, the breach of duty is clear. The guidelines were not followed and the medical literature in respect to uh, intubation was not considered. The one thing we can do if we can't have more people and more resources is to try and look at how we do it and put in place exactly protocols and checklists and drill people in these and support each other and say, speak up when you see something that isn't what it should be. Kieran Reynolds is now 18. You ready for the spa? Blink, blink. If you're ready for me for now, what do you take? He had wanted to be a barrister. Hey, yes. Okay. I'll be here. Get back, Kieran. He was the brightest of our three children by some way. He was really gifted academically. This one you like, isn't it? Unfortunately, he's blind, which really upsets me particularly. He's a quadriplegic. He uh, can't swallow properly, so he's fed through a tube. Watch out for piranhas. They're like a, it's floating down the Amazon, isn't it? Every waking day is a sense of grief, really. That sounds awful, but to get through a day, I don't think you can ever really get over that when something like that's happened to your youngest son. Survived it, Kieran. Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. There you go. Here we come. Pop it. That's it. The Reynolds family made a formal complaint about Dr. Giles Ellingworth, the GP anaesthetist who conducted the procedure on Kieran. We felt nobody was going to do anything about changing anything and stopping it happening to somebody else. We didn't do it for vindictive purposes. We did it because we're nurses. And as nurses, you advocate for your patients. Unfortunately, to the disappointment of the family, uh, the medical council decided not to take any further action after speaking to Dr. Ellingsworth and made only recommendation in respect to a variety of educational activities to be undertaken. There is no public record of the investigation. There is no record of the findings and there is no record of any restrictions placed against the doctor. Good work. Why still? How can it be that a young man's life is destroyed, his family devastated, and the Australian taxpayers are left to foot care bills for the rest of his life and yet nobody is held accountable? I don't get that. You OK? Dr Ellingworth yeah. still works at Bega. He oh. didn't respond to our questions, but GP anaesthetist Dr Gabriel Curry worked with him for years. He's an excellent GP anaesthetist, and it just goes to show that you can be as good every second of every day for years at a time, and one day you're going to get it wrong. But while ever human beings are doctors and doctors are human beings, we will all continue to have mistakes that hopefully the systems in place will pick up before they cascade into the catastrophic events or tragedies as we've seen here. Management of the new hospital at Bega said it was deeply sorry for what had happened to Kieran and had improved processes to enhance patient safety.
all of these people have spoken out because they feel that patients across Australia deserve to get proper treatment, no matter where they are. If we don't do something and speak out, then this will just keep on happening again and again all around the country in rural and regional centres. I can't change it now, what's happened to Kieran. We can only do our best to continue to care for him in the best capacity we can. But we have to look to make sure that this doesn't happen to anyone again. <laughs>